it, it, it's funny, it's, architecture isn't what I do. Architecture is who I am to start with. So um, it's kind of, it's more, um, I'm a person that investigates and asks questions about the world like anybody else and is trying to figure out my position in it. And definitely, um, as a teacher, I'm interested in, um, I guess, continually asking questions of the nature that ask what is architecture's, what is our role in, in um, how do we participate in, in a contemporary world? And, uh, and it's a question that has to be continually asked because it keeps changing. And definitely in my short period of time of working on the last, whatever, 40 some years, it's changed radically in terms of the, 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 the role of architecture and it's um, even more so maybe in the academic, in the academic sense. I don't know, I look at this point in my life, I look back and I was kind of very lucky because I showed up here again by coincidence um, and I'm coming out of a school that's the only school in LA at the time, the USC undergraduate. And it has, um, it is more or less the center of modern US architectural history, starting with a bit of Frank Lloyd Wright, but then Schindler and Neutra who showed up here from Vienna. And um, Neutra is being in the Lovell House in 1928, a year between, before Villa Savoy, right? Not getting The credit, because because it's like Mexico, we're still a one, at that time for sure, we're a one city country. And LA is still hinter, hinterland and provincial. But in fact, um, modernism is taking root in this city, deep root with these two thinkers. And then right out of that are coming the case study characters. And it's the Gregory Ains and it's the, the Pierre Konics and it's the Serianos and on and on. Another group of very kind of, of thoughtful architects, which are the beginning of, would it be the second wave or the, is it still early modernism or the second wave modernism, post-World War II then. And um, I show up, they're now retiring or, or at their end of their careers and they're my undergraduate and we're revolting against them and looking for something else to go. And it's the beginning of, uh, of course it's the 60s, so I'm, I'm involved in not wanting to go to Vietnam and I'm involved in obviously the, the, the civil rights and it's an incredibly vital time in this country. And film and music and I'm just older, just younger than Mick Jagger. I mean, we're in the middle of that, right? And it was intoxicating, the pure energy, right? And it promoted things that were, um, it was about resistance. So people ask me, oh, I'm an architect that's part of resistance, but I was actually part of a greater thing. Yeah, I can't claim that that's my thing at all. It was something that, that, I was, that you couldn't escape. It was the nature of the world. And it was everywhere, obviously, in the art, in, as an art and political and cultural form. And, um, and so, I'm living in Venice after I'm out of school, and um, I've worked for a couple people, but I'm already sensing I want to go on my own, and I'm, I'm, I start my own firm, I'm 28 years old, and a ridiculous idea, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, but I'm naive enough, and, and vision, I'm um, well, both naive and, and kind of optimistic enough to think I could do it. And at the same time, we end up starting a school, but I'm in Venice and it's, it's um, Heiser and Irwin and, and Terrell that are all, mm, they're all doing their first work here. I'm going across the street to uh, Doug Christensen's Ace Gallery. Um, it's across the street and, and seeing Heiser's first show and Terrell's first show and Irwin's down on, on, on Market Street where I'm later gonna do a little building. Um, it was kind of a remarkable time in LA, right? And, uh, and then with that, there were a group of us that are all starting to hang out together and we're all in our late twenties and it's the Craig Hodges and the, and the Coy Howards and, and some of them had really direct connections to the art scene. I, di I didn't happen to be one of those, I did a little bit, but some of them directly connected <clears throat> or even interconnected through relationships and things. 
And so it was a kind of a really interesting time. It was a really vibrant time, and it was also a, a collective. And I think what took place at that time, looking back, there were huge, dis there were definitely a connected tissue between us, having to do with a, an aspiration, the resistance, looking for things and questioning things and being fairly tough about it. But there were huge differences, but there was an agreement. Um, there was an agreement to be different. And although if you'd have seen us in a jury, you'd have thought we were really at each other, but they were really tough. Afterwards, it was, it, it was, it was much closer to Team 10. It was, it was all about the ideas and the work. Afterwards, it was not personal. We went out and had beers. And we were, we were, we were, we were, there were friendships, deep friendships. And um, it was kind of a really, really remarkable. I was lucky. And I think 80s and 90s, there was, um, in this country, globally, there was a thing, a series of things taking place with um, the communication of architecture and the publication of architecture on multiple modes. And so we're getting asked by A plus U to do a monograph and we're asked by Domus and there's all these PA is doing awards and I'm becoming known as an architect because I have no work. It's, it's, it's this stuff. And, and um, I'm just discussing that now in a book we're doing. I'm working for 10 years on projects and they're just ideas. Every once in a while one gets built. And um, I'm becoming known as, a, it, it's, it's the output of, of my thinking and it's, I'm an architect, but I'm yet to build. And it was a time when you could do that and, and start, start your, what do you want to call it, a career or something. And uh, which I think would be much more difficult today to do. And, and then with that, there was a group of us that were kind of connecting together that helped. There was a, the, the LA, what do you want to call it? There was an LA school at that time. And, um, but LA was moving from a provincial place to a global place and they were looking at LA and it was also usurping New York. The art scene had done it 10 years before us already because all of a sudden they realized New York was dead. It was actually the Terrells who these guys are talking about was happening here, not in New York. And uh, New York was old school. And of course, that happened right away. There was an East Coast, West Coast, you talked to Eisman just now. And that was just enjoyable because a lot of us were teaching both places. I went to Harvard in education. I'm born in Waterbury. I'm an East Coast. I'm, I was born in Waterbury, Connecticut. I grew up in Chicago. So I'm an East Coast guy that came here as a young, young man. And we we're teaching mostly in, well, not everywhere, but Columbia, wherever. And so there's already, <clears throat> with my generation, a connection between the East Coast, mostly through. I think through Columbia and Bernard Schumi. And uh, <clears throat> that touched some of these other schools. And, but there became kind of a, a useful rivalry. If we could have Peter here, we could go at it and, 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 and go at And we're, um, which is a bit true, they're a bit more doctrinaire, intellectual, I'll put quotes around it, whatever. Uh, and they're going to come at it from a particular point of view. And it's going to be a little looser here. We're going to be speaking a little in a little more relaxed way, but we're going to, the whole scene here is going to be especially seen in their eyes. You have to ask them, I can't say, but it's going to be a, a little bit more relaxed and let's say just a little more intuitive, to, but making it simpler, simple, right? That, um, and less verbal. And there's good, and then certain people, Frank would represent kind of the icon of that being extremely not verbal, it's the work. And Peter might be the, at the other end, verbal, definitely. And, and there would be the two kind of characters of the opposite extremes that would represent those two things. But it was extremely useful that it was a, um, a useful competition that kind of pushes you to be more, what, articulate or conscious of your own position. That, so we had to become more verbal in defending a position, and they had to actually do the work or do something. I don't know what it means to be more intuitive, whatever, to, to, to counter that. And, uh, and it still shows up, clearly. You could, I think, in, uh, you tell me, you're the outsider. Uh, you, you look at it and you can, I would think there would be still a connective tissue of, of a certain, uh, my generation of architects in the West Coast that would be differentiated from a group you put together in the East Coast. And it'd be, it would be, it is a little more relaxed and kind of more open to the absorption of the day-to-day -day and stuff. 
and some of it is more extreme. And Eric Moss, who literally puts stuff cheek by jowl, that's going to certain orthodox architects are, and it's not pretty. It's not compositional in an accepted way, right? And it, they're going to really, right? And then maybe I'm kind of in between. I can put some stuff together, but I'm actually, I, I, I have more maybe conventional, I do have kind of conventional notions of whatever, aesthetics or whatever, but there's going to be a, a big range here. And again, add coy, and it'd be really idiosyncratic. And, um, but there's a, maybe one of the connective tissues, there's an interest in, in the um, idiosyncratic. Uh, I remember one of the first buildings that this had huge influence on me, and one of the first architects was James Sterling. And I, I, I first saw it in publication, then I made my way to, to London and to see them. It's, you know, each one is a spoke, so it takes a while. It takes a, a day trip to each one when you go to Oxford and Leicester and all those. And I remember I got to Oxford, and it's this weird thing that does this and is propped up with the stairs that come out of the back. And in, in, in traditional terms or in compositional terms, if, you're a, if you, you started with Lutchens or somebody, it's, it's kind of ugly or it, it'd be, like whatever you want to say, it'd be non-aesthetic somehow or clumsy or something, this mechanical kind of thing. And I just fell in love with that stuff. Ditto Oxford, ditto Cambridge. <clears throat> and I, I couldn't figure it out. I just, I couldn't verbalize it. I couldn't understand it. And years later, it might have been a decade later, I finally figured out what was so interesting to me was that precise thing, that it was kind of clumsy and awkward. And if that's what I actually, I couldn't articulate, but I liked that notion. And it was an, it was an attack. Maybe, maybe it wasn't an attack, it's just who he was. But it, it appeared to be an attack on a, a certain conventional notion of architecture. That, that basically is, is involved in, in much more accepted notions of composition and, and, and proportions and that kind of thing. And, um, and that's one of the things I think connects the, the gang out here, is an interest in um, kind of expanding the notion of aesthetics maybe, you'd say, kind of what is it, and not accepting uh, of the norm. And, and out of that will come other things that are um, instead of trying to define them through aesthetics in a conventional sense, for me, it'd be more interesting to talk about them in terms of compellingness. Make, make sense? Compellingness, they just make you think. Like you look at one of Moss's buildings, and for me, they're kind of odd. It'd be, I'd have the same conversation with Sterling, going, oh, I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't personally do that, and, but that's him. And there are these kind of funny things and that kind of push together and things, and, and they sometimes seem to connect in a certain way. And, but finally you look at, it's, it's the nature of a character that has a set of interests in those clearly kind of idiosyncratic things that's just him. It's the person you're talking about. And um, he happens to be a close friend of mine. And if, if you know him, you go, yes, it's, it's Moss. That's, that's who he is, right? And, um, and he's, he's very um, articulate about it. He happens to be, unlike a lot of the people that do that kind of work, he happens to be, um, very intellectually developed and articulate. And now you have to connect the, the verbal and the, and the work, and that's another, another discussion. But, um, but anyway, the point being is, um, um, it would go back to what we started talking about with, the, with, with these, these pieces, um, in interest in constantly kind of exploring the whole notion of what is even beauty when we talk about architecture. And, how important is even in terms of certain kind of projects, and <clears throat> and um, looking at work that that demands kind of the redefinition of how we even evaluate work would be our job in some ways, right? If you're interested in kind of pushing the discipline, right? <clears throat> Otherwise, just stop and do what you do well, and you're fine. And um, but that's the part that kind of keeps you going. I'm 77, so I need kind of stuff to keep me going, and, and um, I don't I don't want to be done, and I don't want it finished, and I want to still ask questions that lead me to something, right? And that's why you you you, you muck around with new kind of ideas and systems, and of course this stuff is um, I'm getting more and more interested in kind of AI-ish stuff, 
I'm now doing a set of drawings. Uh, Peter over there is working on it. We're writing <clears throat> a program. We're scripting a program that's who I'm going to script my sketches. But it'll give me infinite option versus the... I, st I stop and do 20-minute, um, uh, very quick, shut off the mind, kind of instant things. But I do like 200 of them over a period of a month, two months. And uh, we're now looking at, we're, we're, we're trying to organize a certain kind of randomness. And I'm really interested in, in the role now of, of the tools we have and its relationship to highly subjective personal acts and the relationship between this and the tools we have, and especially with architecture, which in fact demands the, um, the discipline and the precision and the... Uh, of, of, of the method that requires for construction, but would be no different. Uh, I remember listening to Miles Davis talk about the extreme um, pushing music to where it's at the edge of noise in terms of its compositional, between its coherency, requires the most, the most rulemaking, the most discipline, the most rigor, and that's absolutely true for architecture that with this comes a huge necessity, right, for discipline and rigor and pre the precision out of the process. And it's that precision, um, for me, I, you can say yes or no, but I look at these drawings and I'm trying to produce drawings that feel like they come out of my hand. I never touch them. They're completely developed by AI-ish, by scripting. And, um, uh, but I can develop something of huge complexity that's coherent. And it's kind of my current kind of set of interest, and it's starting to lead now to the building right behind you, the, the pavilion. I'm starting to find, so I can make three of these out of the same system, and they have the same DNA matter, but I can show you a hundred variations of each one that were done in a night. Another kind of conversation. It'd take a 60-person office and take it down to six, because now I don't have to have a huge staff showing me six options. I can show 100 options, 200, right, through a process that, that's moving, which, yes or no, we'll see what happens, but it is the idea. And, um, and it's dealing with the reality we talked about earlier. I've got to do these things now. You have to work. Architects are left behind. We're still Renaissance characters. We work in such an incredibly primitive way compared to how the rest of the world works. And the rest of the world is, is this, tomorrow. Right, and we do have to respond to that if we're going to have a, if, if we have a, um, if you get a job, forget the, the artistic, cultural notion, if you're just going to connect to society, right? If um, if you have any kind of agency, right? And um, again, I'm interested in that as an architect, you have to be interested in both very pragmatic circumstances of what architects do in terms of building, and concretizing the world, right? Giving it physical form and ideas. But it takes that relationship between the subjective and the rational constantly. You're, you tell me, you're an architect. You, 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 you've, got to have two, you've got to have a left and a right that work together and they can move back and forth at nanoseconds. Otherwise, wrong profession. And you, you, one or the other, stay with the building side and the, te the tectonic side or move and be a poet, stay with that side. But if you're building stuff and interested in, in the conceptual realization of those things, you've got to be moving at the speed of light. And that also kind of where that's, it goes back to kind of why I'm here. I'm trying to get rid of some of that one side and you're concentrating on the other one. Because it, it, it's, it, that does kind of, it's exhausting over, uh, right? At some point in time, it's, it's somewhat exhausting. I've been doing it long enough now where I'm in a particular phase of my own personal development that I'm critiquing my own, it's my own self-critique of, of what I've done or haven't done. And I'm also in a particular moment of change where I'm, um, I'm making a shift at this moment in terms of um, the, my current preoccupations. And um, you're in my own private studio now. And my office has grown and it's plus minus 100 people and it's um, does it, 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 
this is a kind of a complex organizational structure, and it's, it's run by four partners right now. <clears throat> and I'm taking certain projects, and I'm at a place now where I've, I've dealt long enough where I'm moving in quite a few projects in a, a good size office. And um, I'm in the mood now to get deeper and work on more singular projects and uh, versus kind of touching and organizing the broad kind of focus of many projects. And um, so a lot of things I'm going to talk about would be have to do this kind of particular place where I'm working on one competition right now and I'm finalizing a, a project that's going out of construction, <clears throat> thinking about the next project I'm going to work on. And then I'm drawing and working on my conceptual pieces because I'm interested in, um, I'm ready to start something. I started my practice. I was part of starting a school. I started the Now Institute 20 years ago in urban work. And I'm in the mood of making another kind of shift and I need to kind of reinvent something. I'm, I'm in a place where I need to, I need to do that. <clears throat> and so the, the, the artwork I'm doing, artwork, the conceptual work is um, I'm, I'm looking at both coalescing and somehow bringing to a conclusion certain things I've been dealing with and realigning myself into some new, a new direction of which I don't know what it is. Um, but that's what's preoccupying me right now is to start something new. Uh, but definitely um, it deals in depth because I think one of the problems of architecture is thinness right now. We're asked to do too many things too quickly, and I've watched that happen in my in in in, in the time I've spent as an architect. That um, everything's moving at quicker and quicker pace, and they're getting bigger and more complicated, and um, we're losing control of our own process. And in any artistic endeavor, writing, theater, music, if you lose your the control of your own processes, you're done. You have to own your method, right? Because that is the location of your work, right? And I'm really interested now in the um, re-looking at that um, ownership and uh, what it takes to do what I'm interested in doing. And it's being, um, it's eroded. I'm aware that this erosion that I've seen. And I've been somehow, I, we, m my group, Morbuses, is I think been pretty good at keeping up with that pace um, using the shift in the digital world that started in the mid 90s. So we can, and using experience and, and the, the, our past work as a foundation. And we've been, I think, fairly good at it, but, but still um, it's, um, it's for me problematic that you just need more thinking time, and, and especially with an art form like architecture, which is um, has a level of permanence that's separate from all the other arts, right? And uh, that needs the complexity and the multiplicity of, 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 of the thing that is read over. It, it can't be seen instantaneously. It's, it's experienced over time, over different climates and different sun conditions and different social conditions. And that comes out of kind of a deep thinking that takes place of developing something, challenging it, the reiterative process of design, which we've been kind of known for. Um, you produce something, you challenge it, you critique it, you rework it, you do it again and again and again. And the call poppers false solution. The things we do here are never solutions, they're false solutions. They're the, they're the next stage of something. And they're, um, if we do them right, they're endless. They only open up to new possibilities. And, uh, or they lead to next projects or next conceptual ideas of next projects. And um, it takes time. And it takes, um, I think when you, when you go through that process, you look at something and you've got to uh, internalize it and, it, it, it and you have to work with it and then come back. It, um, you're an architect. Yes. It's a classic. You finish at night and you, you, just, you just hit something and you just, you're gonna sleep really well and I just nailed it. You wake up in the morning, you've worked on it even in your sleep and you look at it again, it's not the same thing you thought it was. It's classic, right? And you go, mm. Seemed like everything was kind of lined up in a certain way, but mm. when you really kind of sat on it, you different, gotta li listen to it again, right? Go out again. 
and I, I'm, I need the expansion of that kind of stuff. And I'm kind of hiding away here, less people, kind of more focused, some quiet time. Um, and um, control the uh, architectures got so encumbered with management, client. I'm trying to get rid of the client. That's architecture's biggest problem at this point of history is client. And, um, and the amount of management it takes that has nothing to do with design, which takes you away from the work. And uh, I needed a place now where I can protect myself. I've always kind of had that instinct since I was a kid. Um, I think I'm a person that in reality is very friendly to clients on a social way, or I, can, I listen, I work with them. I'm a, I'm a team player, I'm a win-win person. Uh, um, I'm interested, or I, I recognize it as my obligation uh, architecture is a social art form of solving their problem and their problem separate from my problem and or, or my interest in aesthetics or my interest in formal kind of ideas and I'm, I'm interested in that but um, it can be annoying in that it takes you away from your project meaning the, the, the quality finally of architecture is a cultural art form right and um, it's um, and it takes your it finally works on you where you get so encumbered in the pragmatic world that it destroys your inner life, that you can no longer come up with stuff you want to come up with. And I'm trying to, I'm, I move back into a more protective territory here where I can, let's say I find a, a better alignment or a balance between all the contingency that is part of architecture and the reality, which is a more private act. And, a, and one when you're working with team people that's much more intimate that you're operating subjectively and nobody has to understand what you're talking about except this group. It'd be no different if you're Bergman or Woody Allen making a film. You're, you're, the conversation you have is incredibly subjective. And if anybody else listened to it, you'd be talking in tongues, right? And it'd be, of course, it's whatever it discussed because the conversation is struggling because you're actually working through the stuff. And the conversation is some way secondary, which is the best we can do to in terms of the verbal communication that's necessary to communicate some minimal threshold of, right, that allows us to move forward and, and to understand each other verbally. But finally, it's not that. It's the understanding of something that's not verbal, right? It's, and that you might not even know. It might not be describable if you're doing something really interesting. There, are, there is no words for it yet. You're, you're, it precedes words. It's pre-intellectual, right? It comes before understanding, which is a whole other conversation. Architecture should be developing philosophy and not the other way around. The, the, people should be understanding the nature we work in a certain way and it's worth in a visual world <clears throat> and a conceptual world that doesn't exist in, in, in the verbal world. It's a different world. And that they, they at times parallel in terms of interest. So I'm interested in unfinished and, and openness. And so I'm reading Alberto Eco. And of course, there's a the complete alignment and so it's useful because I can put into words now, into language, a, a very intelligent thinker that can discuss a subject of openness, right? In broad terms, um, intellectually, um, cult culturally, etc. That is his medium and not my medium, and it's useful, but it's not the thing finally. It's still a parallel to my interest in something that could be um, read is open-ended and that reads uh, in, uh, uh, futures and, and other creative acts and unfinishedness, et cetera, which comes out of my, my thinking, right? That comes out of the work. Um, that doesn't allow a person to ever finally even contain the thing, because I'm not gonna allow that. I'm gonna keep kind of moving in a way where you're, you're not able to, if anything, I'd be interested in work that you can't explain that you can't describe. That's what I'm interested in. And things that I couldn't pre preconceive, which of course the, the digital world is taking this to a place. It's um, your operational strategy allows you to go somewhere where you can't preconceive. And if I have, a, if I have a, some sort of a, a desire, that's this, something that's a continuing passion, it's, um, it wakes me up in the morning. My son's a really good surfer and he'll talk about surfing and every wave is different and you never know where you're gonna be and just a continual 
dynamic going on and I'm going, I understand. I want to come to work and ask a question. I have no idea where it's going and that's exactly why I'm interested in doing it. If I knew what I was doing it, change, take care of it, draw it up and build it and we're done. And I'd, it'd probably be a nice life. I'd have time to play golf, I'd have time to do all kinds of stuff, right? And, uh, but it's, um, it seems like one of these that's taking place today was so interesting is that with the, uh, and we've had now 25 years of kind of practice with the addition of the digital world is it radically advances information and an ability to, to um, grasp complex problems and it ups the ante. Kessler says we can, we can hold seven things in our mind simultaneously and now we're, we can deal with hundreds of input and for architecture that's everything of course, right? Especially as it becomes urban and it, it reaches larger scales, et cetera. And, um, and then with that, it opened up, as you well know, um, it opened up, uh, expanded exponentially um, formal possibilities that had to do with complex interacting geometries, et cetera, which led in my case to the combinatory kind of stuff that relationships, the combinatory behavior and that kind of thing that allows us to produce things that we couldn't have produced um, 25 years ago that were extruded and Cartesian and orthogonal, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we just seemed like it's preoccupied architecture for the last couple decades. And I would say now it's kind of over and we're kind of going back to looking at what's the project again. And then it finally just services a project. And, and again, we're, you're now describing, well, finally it is a project and the project is political, cultural, social. And these are the, the formal, this is how we concretize it. These are the formal terms of that. that um, that are responding to that condition or that are somehow participating with some potential usefulness, right? In the nature of society and kind of how we operate and how architecture connects to that. And, um, but that's still, um, that's kind of never ending right now because of the options that opened up the, the competition, right? And it's, um, I think a lot of people think they're confused that they think it solves problems. It's just a tool. It's a very kind of a straightforward, well, it is kind of a simple tool in some ways. Um, uh, it is X's and O's. And um, it can be, it, it can now operate as in chess and beat Kasparov and those kind of things, but those are still, it's just information and X's and O's. It can't produce mystery. It can't produce unknown chance behavior Etc. It finally doesn't have the things that make us human. It changes how we even evaluate um, it evaluate uh, intelligence. Memory now is uh, uh, that's a whole other kind of subject we could talk about. The whole notion of how we evaluate intelligent people are basically has been memory. And anybody that, that goes through high school, or if you if you know if you can memorize eight dates, five names, kind of one concept, you can you're gonna you're gonna be an A student all the time. And if you have a, I'm dyslexic, I have a horrible memory, <clears throat> made a horrible student because of that. Um, it's good for me. It's meaningless now. We, I can Google anything in three seconds and we want a, a particular date of a particular historic occurrence. And it's gonna kind of move it into something I think much more interesting within a much more cre creative, emotional intelligence, a, a different kind of human intelligence that I think it's gonna, it's heading that direction, which I think in, for architects or for architecture is going to be an interesting thing because it reminds us that the things that we're interested in might be much more connected to, like in the work that you were referring to, my, my um, Strange Networks pieces, I'm interested in, in um, a certain spontaneity and chance behavior and they're a negotiation between willfulness and chance and I'm looking for um, behaviors that take place between things that are more or less random and I'm interested in, in organizing that randomness which is reality it's it's um it's Joyce's look out the window the, the reality is this this cacophony right and um, that cacophony is is um, contempor the contemporary world and things are butting into each other some of them meaningful some of them purposeful some of them absolutely accidental and that's reality and uh, you might make a whole theory out of that that all of us are based on. There's nothing in our life isn't chance, starting with our birth, 
right? And it's actually, you take that down and on a very personal level, it's kind of interesting. You meet somebody, I meet my wife because I decided to see a Woody Allen film with a girlfriend that I've been trying to go out with for years. And she happens to be three seats away from me and knows the girlfriend and it was with somebody else. And we make eye contact and then see each other again and then get together and then two years later we have a baby. But now we just started a whole sequence of the world. That's, that's reality, right? Not and including, it started with our birth. It was the same thing. And um, I'm kind of fascinated in the kind of those aspects right now and kind of how they, they shape architecture that isn't dealing with this absolutely kind of platonic controlled notion, repetition, the same things that can deal with um, apparent contradictions, let's say, but deals in just reality. It's, not, it's, not, um, it's nothing about the future, it's about the present. Again, that's a whole kind of interest. The, the 50s were about the future conceptually. Today, we're, trying to, we're, tr we're having a hard time absorbing the present. Forget the future. The future, in fact, the, 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 will the future even exist would be the question, right? Um, are we gonna make it to, hmm. I've always been concerned when I wake up, in the, I get to the next day, and somehow I was born that way. I've never concerned myself with the trajectory. I wake up and go to work. People ask kind of what I do. I get up every morning and I work every morning. I do it for, for 50 years. And this is what came out of it, right? And, um, and every day I just, I start that day based on whatever the, the forces are, right? And um, it's just, it's living in a contemporary world. It's li in, in our contemporary world right now is, there's a lot of conversation of what that is. We seem to be in a kind of a bind with tribal, kind of an old tribal system and, and a new multicultural system. And people seem to have very strong opinions both ways, right? And there's a group and there's a counter revolution going on that, that the tribe is still the way we want to go, right? These drawings, I, I've been doing that for a long time. Um, some of the models are made after construction. Some of them, Somebody reminded me, we have this book coming out right now, that five or 10 years later, I'll redo a model of a project of a decade ago and redo it again and look at it again. And I'm still working with it. But to me, it's still alive, the model. It's still about an idea and I'm tinkering. And so I'm gonna rework it a little bit or maybe um, just give it a different color, race it or whatever. Um, and the same with the drawings. Way back in the beginning, I, one of my first projects was the, the Lawrence House. I did a set of drawings and everybody thought they were the development drawings. They were after the building was finished construction and they were used to rethink it because I wasn't happy with it. So I redrew it as a kind of cathartic, both to get rid of the kind of the pain of things that we, I didn't, I built this thing and uh, uh, it's not what I want and then something's wrong here and it's very deep. It's, um, it's not minor, it's, it's major. Um, and I redrew it. And, um, and so for me, Model making, conceptualizing and model, drawing and building are in any number of sequences. It's not drawing, model, building. No, no, that's technical, of course, you do that. Um, no, it's thinking out a problem in the way you want to think it out through drawing is one way of thinking, model making is a, demands another kind of response from that thinking and obviously the construction is the, it, mm, not the final act, it's, it's the maybe be considered the most important act. That's also for me. Mm. If a drawing, if, it, if something gets too compromised by the forces of reality, I'm with the model. That's my project. This one is life. And I actually, I'm quite flexible about my love affair or what I think is most quote important. And um, not at all the building. I would never say that. Yes, that's the goal. That's what I would hope it to be. Um, but, uh, no, and so, and so the, these, I was very conscious with the 3D environment, and I talk about it in my academic work, you no longer draw a plan, done, as of middle 90s, planometric. No, and it was the, is it, whatever, 2,500 year history or something, we can go to Greece, a plan. And um, huge amount written about drawings, Right, and plan, and then perspective and renaissance, et cetera, right? Um, no. Oh, and section, and the section is vertical. 
and it's called a plan and a section. I'm going, no, it just changed. As of the middle of the 90s, and if with computation, we're making something 3D, they're all sections, number one. There ain't no plan. There's a section that does X, X Y, and Z, called, and we call one a section and one a plan as architects, but they're CAT scans. They're exactly the way your cardiology is. You look at your, your, your heart, right? And they're decided there's certain distances between what you want to look at as information. And so all of a sudden, the thing is made this way, and it's constructed and it's thought about as a 3D thing. And now you cut CAT scans, and let's say we still stay with the tradition. So there's one that's sectional that's useful to us, and one that's a plan. We still kind of organize events, but it's it's second. And so with that, with the conceptual drawing, it's the same thing. You're looking at drawings that are a resultant of a 3D thinking of invention something. So you've invented the complexity, spatially, an organization of something through modeling something 3D. And definitely now, when you're interested in chance behavior, you're, you're moving things in a way that you can't control them. You can control certain aspects, but a huge amount of it is gonna to have to do with a certain randomness. And your, the willfulness is you finding connective tissue that would be the same as a Miles Davis now. You're looking at or a, a Keith Jarrett, or who you wanna look at. What is the connective tissue between the three of you that makes it coherent? Right, and you're defining that, so you finally look at these, I'd have to ask somebody, is it, is it totally random? And if the notion is no, I can see it's organized, but I don't know why, then we're going in reverse. So it is organized because it's not, it's not disorganized, so the conversation is we don't quite understand why it's organized, right? would be the conversation, right? But anyway, today it's reversed, and it's really interesting. And so the, the drawings now, we're doing that now, we're working on a competition for a, for a, um, for a, a, a space for um, uh, Ai Ching, who's Ai Weiwei's father in China. It's a really interesting project. And um, the whole thing is being developed 3D, and we're cutting plans and now talking about them traditionally as where the theater is and where stuff is, and if it's big enough, and it, the square footage is, we're cutting the vertical and having the same conversations of putting it within architectural tradition but they're, they're secondary. And now we're using those mostly in terms of performance to give the, this thing that has an organizational idea, which is, a, which is from a conceptual direction, to make it perform and to, um, to align with the various functionalities of a, a fairly complex set of, um, of, of, uh, of demands, black box, proscenium theater, et cetera, right? And, um, and it's really interesting, the reversal. And of course, it takes you someplace totally different. It's this, I mean, the most basic thing, this no longer, and it'd be show up in all our work, it's no longer extruded. And the extrusion already is an incredible simplicity. And of course, it's gonna completely challenge you with structure because the extrusion keeps the structural model simple, line. Once you do this, eh, now you've gotta kind of rethink a gravity. So now gravity becomes something that consumes an office because our biggest problem is how do you hold shit up in the air, all right? And unlike Lebius, we're not making drawings where we can put big, heavy steel things in the air and cable them down. And it's the beauty of a drawing that you can invent stuff that's impossible. Our piece of steel has to stay there and it connects you to certain people. So um, if I talk to a Wolf Pricks, He's a, a master of figuring out, right? And how to deal with gravity in clever ways where it always finds its way to the ground in a kind of unique, and you're made aware of the thing, the, of its weight, of its mass, of its physicality, right? Because the fact that it has an unusual connection to ground, right? And um, again, it just starts taking you someplace in your work. That you, be, you become preoccupied because you have to become preoccupied because it's a consequence of the direction you're going. Make sense? And then the organization just gets more complex. You're dealing with varied geometries which require constructional techniques, which I mean you have to now become interested in how do you, what's it made out of? And how do you make this thing that has all double curves or that has um, our, our giant building, which is landscape building. It has a steel structure where every piece of steel is different. So it has 
18,000 individual pieces, and they're all different. Good news is the steel fabricators work like we do. It's not, it's all on a machine. It's a computer run. So it doesn't matter. The computer just says cut it like this or cut it like this, and it's, it looks like we did it here, right? And it, it's put together like a tinker toy. And, and um, again, the kind of the whole world is kind of shifted that allows us to do things you couldn't even vaguely anticipate. There's also a very interesting feed, feedback loop from the real thing back to the process that's now altering the process, right? And, um, and because there are no longer drawings in just a sense, we're, instead of drawing things, we're making things digitally. And that's a huge, mm, schools are even kind of mixed up about that right now. We're not, strangely enough, the academic world hasn't caught up with the real world in my, my mind. And because that has said, no, 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 we don't draw things. When I talk to people now, you look at it, it's a staircase. It is something. It's not an abstract of something. It is something. And, and in case of a staircase, it has a very set of rules of vertical and horizontal for a tread. And it has a, it gives it an angle. But it, it is based on an idea, something that very quickly turns into concrete or steel or wood or something. But you actually built it. And that thing you built goes right to the contractor. And so it's taking us back, um, I think, to a really interesting territory where by making things, you're, you're reconnecting to construction. And it's no longer a picture. And then give that to somebody and just make it look like that. But it's, um, it's getting involved in the... Um, by getting involved in making something, you're getting involved in the reality of the efficiencies, which is also the, the constructional process is going to find its way back in the architecture also. You make it in big chunks that are this big or little pieces. You, you, um, you increment it at in, in, in different, in different scales, etc. And um, uh, it, it puts you in control of the, of the process of construction the way you, you control the the method of, of, of invention. It's another kind of whole subject in a way. Um, it seems like it's going to take schools back to, you can work simultaneously on the thing and its reality and the conception, and there's going to be this interplay between the two. And as an architect, you have to be at least aware of both. Maybe you're going to control both, depending on the person. <clears throat> and, um, and information comes in much earlier into the conceptual part of the project which is a part of the reality of, of, of the practice of architecture. I could have answered that question 10 years ago, but I'm kind of inward now, and I'm not looking. It wasn't that long ago that I'd looked at always, just for information, every magazine, everything. I'm just interested in what everybody's doing. I'm just looking at stuff quickly, absorbing stuff. And um, something about 10 years ago, I stopped. I'm not looking out as much. It's just very, my, in the academic world I am with the students. Um, but I'm not, um, I'm, I'm engaged in my own work right now and I have enough things that are preoccupying me that I don't, it would now be contamination. I don't need, um, we started with when I'm 25 and I'm looking at Sterling, different story. Now I'm, I'm yet to be in any way formed. I have no idea who I am as an architect. And I have no pedigree, I have no pedigree in my education. I'm not Mies, and I'm not Corbin, I'm not Alto, and I'm not Khan or Wright. I just named the, 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 the major characters. I barely know who they are. I came out of a weird time of education where you didn't even look. And then I had the case study guys and said, eh, I'm not interested. And, and so I came out kind of just neutral. And, uh, but kind of systems oriented and a little kind of overly uh, kind of a scientific kind of education. It was this weird time in the middle of the 60s when the, a lot of the academia, it was me and McCarg and it was, it was uh, Christopher Alexander and Ralph Knowles was my guy. And um, modernism, it, it collapsed and it, it exhausted modernism. And, um, and so I had to start from scratch in a way. And so it's just things that preoccupy him. And then you're just absorbing everything. And I did Denza work for a while in Rossi. And then I'm just looking at all these different kind of possibilities, postmodernism, six months, and then eh, not, not interested. But you're just, you're moving quickly. And, and again, as you move through, you're, you're getting a little more focused. And the, the people you're interested in have a little bit more to do with your own 
to the questions you're asking and your own kind of preoccupations. And then at this point, um, of course I look at, I look at GA every year just to see he picks whatever, 30 every year around the world and what's going on. And this year I remember when I looked at it, I'm also looking at the back, he lists little pieces of the offices and it's Ben Van Burkle and he has 350 people. And I'm taking off other information. I go, huh, I remember Ben and I talking when he was a kid and he had five people in his office. I got 350, damn, it's a big, and then I get to Winnie Moss, and same thing, like, wow, 250 people. And I, I'm doing that. I, I'm just quickly just getting, okay, these are, and it's kind of, or I'm looking at the work and now it's not, it's just mm, kind of renderings and they're stuck just like me with the same forces of what clients want and they, they want to do this and the work's getting thinner. I'm, I'm, my, it's my own critique. Where's the professional right now? And, uh, and then I come back to the office and go hunker down. No, no renderings. Only architectural drawings that only architects would understand. That's what I want in this magazine. That we're gonna we're gonna be a position. They're gonna hunker down and just talk about architecture in their purest form. And um, and then I get the magazine and I bring my gang around me. Got just what I wanted. Not one rendering. Pure abstract drawings. We're architects, and uh, we don't have to pander to clients 100 percent of the time. And with a GA, come on, only architects look at it. It's stupid. If you can't do architecture drawings for PA, for a GA, who are you going to do it for? Nobody. And that kind of thing. It's shifting. Let's say it's turning strategical. It's getting much more strategic. Not the work. I'm I'm. I've got more than I can figure out. I can't. I don't. I don't need to look anyplace else. That might be a second. I'd love to talk to you and a bunch of younger people. Of, I I think about when I'm in the in, in the academic world. Um, and I look at the, and I'm on juries, and there I'm the only one that's built more than two buildings, much less I have kind of a big practice right now. We have three billion dollars worth of work in, under construction. It's a big practice, um, and I'm looking and going, wow, if I was them, where would I go, or what would be my strategy of like I want to be an architect that builds some stuff, and I it'd be a conversation. I have no idea. Um, complicated one. It's definitely a different world. Uh, we talked earlier about I had a lot of support system. People gave me shows and there were magazine articles. You, you get PA awards. and There were people that honored you as, a, as an architect and the profession honoring its own. So you, you're not on the outside world by where your own profession put you, located you. And that was incredibly useful for you establishing a, a career and getting work. And so I didn't have to build condominiums and I didn't have to work for developers and I didn't have to do things that I didn't want to do, right? And it gave me that option of, of somehow controlling myself, controlling my own destiny to some degree. And um, today that doesn't exist. There is no support system that helps differentiate your generation of why in the profession itself, they say these are people that are doing certain things, ain't no critics. There's no, there's, there's, there's no um, medium that does, right? That does that. Again, a complete different kind of conversation. That's, um, I think, a super critical one in terms of where is architecture moving. Come on, I'm, I'm finishing up a career, and I'm, 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 I'm who I am, and it, it, it come from this different kind of era. Um, the, the, the interest would be, the, 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 where this next generation, kind of, what are the opportunities? And how do they find them within the reality of the political business, the, the capital world, et cetera? I would have said um, we need her on here, but I would have said her non has moved to school. Um, you could say it's a, a, he might not agree with me, I'm just saying well, my, my opinion. Um, I would say that SIAR could be defined as a school of visual studies that specializes in architecture. And so the people coming out of SIAR, I have some. I have a person that does drawings and is a photographer that's a phenomenal photographer. We do our own stuff. Um, I have a person that's a writer and is a, much more of a scholar, et cetera. Well, that came out of Cornell. But I, the people he's the people coming out of Sark now that he's defined it, there's definitely a focus on architecture, but they're gonna people are gonna go to Nike, they're gonna go to um, they're going to, they're again going to connect to the contemporary world 
and they're basically um, visual people. And they're at a school that you have to be comfortable in having a kind of very high level of visual literacy to be comfortable in that school. Um, and I would have said it's, it's, it's a form of connecting to a contemporary world that, that even schools of architecture have to be a bit broader in their mission, right? Understanding that, the, that, that um, you're dealing with something much more basic, again, this visual world that includes architecture but allows for many, many other paths, right? And that uh, a huge amount of your, the, the success of your students will be related to them and be able to move in different paths. Do you think? That it's not just architecture. And, um, and developing connections between um, disciplines, clothes design, object, furniture design, graphics, et, et cetera, um, all de dealing with conceptual structures right, that um, also pushes the different disciplines in different ways also, right, that it affects architecture by, by connecting it to these different disciplines. And um, is an attempt to make the school relevant and no longer could it be just seen so strictly as architecture, right? And um, when you're even questioning the kind of the role of, even like we were discussing earlier, the notion of uh, the whole design process has changed, right? And the, 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 the way work is constructed, it comes from a, it's invented, comes from a very different structure, right? That's, that's, that's under investigation at the moment. Architects have lost vision of urbanism and clients, clients meaning cities and governments no longer even go to architects, they go to landscape architects to do planning. And I'm going, huh. Um, and so I've completely focused in the last 20 years, starting with the NAM Institute at UCLA on urban work, and I'm interested in, um, I think, first of all, I think the most compelling projects that are connected to architecture and urbanism will be in the urban infrastructural area and not architecture. They'll always be good architects, no, no, no question. And there's many, many schools doing that. Um, uh, I think the most compelling projects and the one that need um, a, a very particular kind of intelligence and a set of skills is within the urban, and that's been my interest in, in the academic world. And I'm also trying to expand the, the field back into the broader kind of issues. <clears throat> and I'm finding, I think I'm in synchronization with a lot of young people that are interested, because it starts now with broad ecological, social, cultural, political aspirations of architecture. And, um, I'm, and it, it has to do with working in teams and collectively, and I'm finding young people that are in sync with those ideas and not, in fact, I would say you could consider my practice if it's centered around me, old school, that the singular artist architect, yes, always, but I recognize myself that I represent a kind of a particular place and it has to just do with my DNA, who I am. But is that the model? No, no, that's the exception. And I accept myself as an exception. And a lot of the people I know, I see as exceptions. They're not models. And to promote that as a model, I think is actually just about unethical. Oh, the same group we talked about, LA, we could go at it. Just absolutely scream it, expletive deleted, really go after each other. And um, we, believe, we were fighting for things we believed in. But we could also be straight forward with each other. And, and again, for me, it was fantastic because it, I didn't have, it's not like say, we, Tell me what you really think wasn't going to be a conversation. They, they told you. And it, it, there were critiques that are useful, right? And they happen to be from intelligent, extremely capable characters that are arguing different positions. Today, it's another game. Everybody's so polite. And if you do give a tough critique, always the next thing will be, oh, but it's okay. And I'm looking at them going, no. There is no but it's okay. It's absolutely not okay. What are you talking about? Right? You just totally screwed up the critique of this young person. It's absolutely wrong, and I'll tell you why it's wrong. Learn from it and go to the next project. And if you can't make mistakes, we're on profession. All of your big leaps, you're, some of them will be really painful. And the painful ones are the ones that you'll never fucking forget. You didn't ask certain questions at the beginning of a competition, and then you, you put this immense effort for six weeks, and then the first question they ask, 
went back to the first premise and they couldn't answer it, you're done. You just wasted six weeks of your time. And it doesn't matter how beautiful it looks, you couldn't answer the question. You go back and go, hmm, before I'm about to invest my time and my team for six weeks making all these models and drawings, let's make sure I've got an idea that's the one we want to go forward with and you don't forget it because it cost you a bundle and it hurt you personally, right? You can't do that in school today. Every problem, everybody like, every somebody in the jury likes it. And I'm going, damn, I have no idea how they're going to, I'm going to go, good luck. I, I wish the best, but I have no idea how you're going to grow if every one of your products is okay. And, and then I asked them, do you agree with the critic that it's okay? Don't, can't you be your own critic? And if you can't be, I'll tell you right away, you're going to work for somebody, you're not leadership material. If you're leadership material, you are always your worst critic. My job is to walk around and go, yes, no. It's my, if it comes out of here, it has name amorphous on it. Finally, as the principal of a firm, a single principal, and, and up until recently, in my job. If it goes out and it gets criticized, it comes to me. That's my job, right? I'm the quarterback, I'm, and I, sometimes they get the accolades, sometimes you get the booze, but that's your, <laughs> if you can't get the booze, wrong job. You should be a lineman or go another position, right? And uh, you want to start young people in that direction that understand that, that, and you don't take it so seriously, come on. It's just, this is just a piece of life, and if every little failure, you, again, but um, I had a hard time speaking, and I literally got so nervous I could barely talk. I just couldn't get in front of people. And I remember once after, oh man, a long time, seven, eight, ten years, it was always this. And I remember once I had to give a talk, and then for some reason there was a big crowd, and they had, had to do it again right away. And they'd said, okay, oh, you take a break, we're gonna fill the auditorium and do it again. And then I, I didn't have time to get nervous. I was talking to some people and they said, oh, do it again. And just run them. I, I said, okay. And then we're talking. And then all of a sudden I went to the podium again. It was the first time I wasn't nervous. And I realized that it's part of learning. Finally, you just did it enough. And you, you failed enough times that you go, okay. I, I failed enough times, so what the fuck? I'm, just, I'm going to be more relaxed about it because it's, it, I, I'm not a good speaker. But then all of a sudden, you, you, you forget being nervous and you become, just because you're not nervous, a better speaker. <laughs> right? And it turns you around. And all of a sudden, you can talk and go, oh, actually, I enjoy this now. Right? And, um, but, but it came from absolutely falling on your face and again and again until something happened that just allowed you to get past it. And that should be education. And if they're not doing that, they should be the kids that drop out. Architecture is not for you. My son just went through law school and he had a class on litigation. It's a tough one. And it was, the, the instructor was a judge. And I asked him, and she asked, he had a weird way of asking questions. She used cars with their names on it and do it random. He would pick them down and say, my son's name Cooper. And, and they were difficult questions and complicated legal shit. And, um, he would have to talk about it, and then he, he got called on one day, so the next day he kind of sloughed off a little bit, thinking the odds are he's not going to get two times in a row. It's random. And she called on him, and she wasn't quite ready, and he got through it. He said, oh, wow, tough one, because she was really a tough one, and it's law school, and it's, you got to do what you got to do. And I said, did, did people really crack up? And she said, oh, yeah, sometimes people just lost it. And he was talking about this, this one girl got called, and she just really muffed it, and she just couldn't answer it, and she started crying. The professor reads in her pocket, it's a woman, and she's a judge, walks over and throws a quarter on the ground and says, call your mom. That's law school. It's a class of litigation. If you start crying in a class with a professor and you're a lawyer, a litigator, this is child's play. You're about to really go into a tough thing. You can't cry. Wrong profession. Or do business, not litigation. And, and strangely enough, the class just agreed. Mm. We like her, nice girl. Not the right person to be a litigator. There's a connection there with our, our training. Luckily, we have this enormous range of what, what architects do that give them huge, huge options from the pragmatic end of the scale to the, the subjective end of the scale. And um, and you are going to, in some way, listen to them to some point, 
or you're attracting certain students that have decided that they've looked at the world as they see it and they're making their own kind of judgment of where they're going to go. But it does seem to that you tell me now, and this is, I'm just, but I would say the, the kind of the singular, well, especially male architect, come on, that's super old school. I'm, I, I, I belong to another era and it, it'll keep going. There'll always be singular characters that are just talented, of course. It'd be like um, using Enrique Morais. I think he was probably maybe the most talented architect in the 20th century. And it's a, uh, this tragedy that he died young. He was a Picasso-esque, frightening. He was so, had talent. And I got to know him just a little bit and I just, um, you just, of course, they come along once in a while. It's Muhammad Ali. Yeah, there's one of them in the century. And uh, but that's not, that doesn't lead to a model of education. That's absurd. In fact, that leads to actually a very destructive idea of a model that destroys people. That, of course, you're not going to be him. You're going to become you. And does everybody become that? Of course not. <laughs> That's absurd. And uh, no, it needs, it, it needs to start with a, a broader project. And it seems to me today education is, it needs, there doesn't seem to be much connection of an agreement of what the project is. And we came from a 20th century, an early 20th century, which you might have said overdefined, but it had an absolutely clear project with early modernism, which was social, cultural, political, right? That you could locate, and um, and it had a, a, they 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 had big visions of universalization, which proved not to be true, but were useful and they were actually prophetic, because in fact they did see the world in global terms immediately, but they saw it from a European perspective, which now doesn't kind of work so well. But there was an agreement of what architecture was, so you could have a Weizenhof or wherever you go, whatever your examples are, and there was a connectivity of very diverse people because you would never connect an Alto and a Corbu and a, and a Mies and a, and a Wright or pick your group, all incredibly different people, but there was a connect, connection between all of them having to do with a project, and the project was social political, right? And it was highly urban, and that we were gonna take responsibility of the future of the planet of the city, or whatever, right? And it'd be infrastructure, and they, they, we were able to articulate it's infrastructural and blah, 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 right? Um, and it was so clear that it was very useful. And it got just to me in that you still, I'm still maybe the last generation that finally I went through a phase where I had to completely absorb. And I remember buying the overcomplete, and I didn't have the money, so I bought one book a month, and I made a deal with a bookstore to get the aid, I had, I think it was like 25 bucks in those days, but I had to buy one book a month to ever get the set, and you just absorbed it. And, but there was a, um, again, maybe just about an over an oversimplification, which was necessary, uh, of, of a project that, that, um, that was useful. Somehow we need to come back and find some semblance of some connective tissue that we can talk to each other and make some forward progress through a collective act of asking questions I'm talking about the university now, the educate, which would obviously include the, the profession. And that we're not, it doesn't seem like we're at that place. In fact, it seems like we're at a place where it's completely kind of crumbled and it's hard even to find a conversation. I, again, you tell me, you've interviewed a lot of people. You sit with a young generation on a jury, I have no clue. I have no clue what the conversation is. I can't participate. Each person seems to have their own little private worldview. Much of it not interested in agency accepting their own privacy. And I'm gonna go, uh, uh, okay, maybe for you, not for the profession and not for me personally, that no, we need a group of people that can agree that we have some common ground of what architecture is and we're tackling a problem and the world understands that because if, if there's an issue now with the world not having a high view of architects, it's our fault. We haven't presented a clear program. We spend too much money and we get too involved in what things look like. And we want to talk with this travertine. Bullshit. Not, we should be, we should be trash for that. That's private. Um, when you finally talk about one of these things, how many people would understand this? Under a thousand people in the world. A world that is seven and a half billion people. 
come on, I could, I could put a, a gang in this room. I'd be lucky to fill this studio. This is a private conversation. This is really like coming together with uh, Hawking's and talking about uh, uh, atomic physics. Uh, we did the physics building at Caltech, and uh, they had a private conversation. There were five of them that had any idea what they're talking about. They speak in tongues, right? They'll write a, a, across the board a formula that they all laugh and joke about and talk about, and you, it's, you have no idea. Architecture has that, the, the private part. And I think to start with, we have to separate kind of our own private interests. I don't talk to anybody about it. I talk to people like, I talk to people that are interested in this. But this is a very esoteric kind of conversation. It's, 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 it finds its way into this, and, and, and now it's, it's been translated to something, and I can talk about it. But, it. but there's been some connection with the world as they understand it. And again, if I don't want to do that, it is aggravating, there's no question, because it, it's easy to get wrapped up in this because it's a love affair. But, but finally, as an architect, you have no choice. If you're not willing to be a mud wrestler, it was Obama's problem, he was a little too conceptual, like, hmm, if you want to be president in this world, you got to get in the ring, and it's not for everybody. But as an architect, again, it'd be the conversation with the young people, whatever. By the way, guys, um, that's part of the deal. If you want to have agency, if you, if you want to actually build stuff, if you want to participate with the world, you do have to find ways of putting to their terms. And luckily, um, because we think, let's say intellectually, conceptually, you can make it into something very interesting. It's, it's a, as a political act, or as a cultural act, as a social act, put it in, in intelligent terms and solve complex problems. Um, I have a Tesla. He can, he being Musk and his people, can place that in five or, five or six different contexts. And the macro one that we should be involved with is if this community of 17 and a half million people that we call Los Angeles drove that car, we'd see the mountains every day and the air would be completely blue and we would have 55% um, less pollution is the car. And he could tell you that if you go to the medical profession, that hospitals would have this amount of less people that suffer asthma and they could tell you what demographic they're in, old people, middle, and it would be worth this billions dollars of cost. We could keep going and we could look at the, the car as a mechanical thing something like one-tenth the amount of moving parts. So I can, sooner or later, I'm gonna make it inexpensive because I have less moving parts, right? And um, it includes the, the button for a glove compartment. And you go, oh, this guy's really, the button kind of, work, you push it on the thing, a moving part, right? Really interesting. And um, it handles, it's the, the fast one's quicker than a Ferrari. So it completely fucked up the whole car world. Because Ferraris cost a quarter million bucks, and now my car, my little car, is faster than a Ferrari. And there's no engine. Well, the engines go right to the wheel, so there's no engine, transmission, drive shaft, etc. Right? Gone. And the battery now is at the ground, so it handles like a Porsche, because it's low center of gravity. And he puts a, a stereo in it that's the best, better than anybody has in their home. If you want to listen to music, you can sit in your car and listen to music. And you get upgrades every week. He keeps tuning it, going, huh, this guy really takes care of me. I keep getting, I mean, they changed the, I just got an upgrade, and it's like, going, wow. And he, they redid the brakes, so the brakes work a little differently and a little better, and they operate. And the last one I got changes the stereo, and it, it, it recognizes the music and changes bass and treble. So I'm listening to hip hop or a certain man, and it ups the, the bass. And I'm going, they take care, and then this is getting kind of personal. He's taking care of me. He didn't sell me a car and say, fuck you, right? He keeps going, I'm, I, and then I like that, but that's how I work. Keep turning it, work on it, not done, eh, keep, right? Um, that's the world we've got to join. And he can operate from macro to micro, from me being in the seat to the, to the hospital or to the, 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 the smog of a, of, a, of a 17 million city. And we have to be do that. You design a house, if you can't talk about the consequence of that house to the city, you might, you're, you're not dealing with the problem. And you're worried about the design of a door or something. It's contributing to the environment you live in and you can't breathe the air, blah. 
that you have to solve that before you get to the fun stuff. And then you get to do the little playful thing that's yours, that the client might love, you love, whatever. But you've got to deal with a complete problem. And, and I think we're, we're not in good shape. And the public has it right. They have a right, the right to have, we, 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 de we, get, we deserve some of that because we're not, we're, we're, not, um, we're not clear about the program again. It goes back to the big, big question of the modernism. We need a, a broader notion. And the young people need that. I'm going back to my jury now. What is the agreement we have to these people that, that are absolutely, um, we can't agree on certain things that these are absolute requirements of being an architect in, in, in 2021, right? Can't do it. And the, the, the agreements might be all insignificant. The things they're disagreeing with, maybe none of them are even significant. The things they're arguing with, wrong problem. Ah, and then it gets, I'm not really in this. And then it does, I would have said, we're, um, right below Art Center of Pasadena. Art Center produces all the car designers of the f first of the world that work for Toyota, the, everybody, the Germans, come out of there. If you go up there, they style these cars. Wrong problem. Musk didn't even go there. He hired chemists and phys, not people in the auto industry, because that they get it all wrong. Analogy to architects. Let's rethink the car. First thing that goes is the fucking engine. That's the problem, right? Didn't used to be a problem, but now when you put 17 million cars on the road in one area, it's now a problem, right? And so first thing that goes is the combustion engine, and, and, and that's not even, come on. Everybody already knew that. That's like a, a propeller plane going to a jet. That, that it, it, the, the combustion engine is the end of a shelf life. And so that he's just doing something that's kind of obvious, but then he's doing it. Right? And then with that, he just to start making a car and he goes, okay, now it starts where the battery goes and what can, where I'm gonna spend my resources and what a car is, but I'm gonna redesign a car. It's also gonna be safer and it does, when it rolls over, it never burns, there's no gasoline in it and it doesn't leave oil in your driveway and it doesn't, every gas station doesn't pollute like they're, they're building something across the street. They can't get it built because they have to take out six meters of earth because it's all polluted because of the gas station. And it, 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 but those are the big ones he's dealing with. We have to be at that level as architects. And the world has to understand us as that. Of course that, we're involved in the problems that are really real problems. And by the way, we produce things that are, cult, that, that, that are part of the culture of architecture and a, a, a 3,000 or a 2,500 year culture. And you can, well now if you're East and China, it's one thing, if you're West, it's, it's, it's it's, it's Greek culture, wherever you want to go. And uh, yes, of course. And it's, it's a cultural object, but it has to connect the problems that, that are more basic than that, that people understand.